Amen. Amen. Thank God. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. We just heard what the Holy Ghost is saying, and God is trying to get our attention. Uh, that was a prolific revelation, <laughs> profound. Hallelujah. Thank God for Hank Kuderman to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. How many are going to leave encouraged just from that? <laughs> Amen. Um, and I, I'm just going to change things. We were going to have a worship song, but there's such a vein of the prophetic word of the Lord. I think I, I thought I prophesied everything I had last night, and all of a sudden, you, did, you know, you get in that vein, you can feel it. Um, but this man of God, um, there are no ways to define Robin Bullock other than he is a powerful prophet of the Lord that God supernaturally has brought for this hour to release what God is saying. Every time I get around this man, it's like I see another facet of the hand of God that's in him. This is a deep well. Hallelujah. He is a deep well. And uh, again, a tremendous gift to the body of Christ that kept us from losing hope. And the Lord has used this man and his wife. And so make welcome tonight, Prophet Robin Bullock. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift up our hands and give God praise and honor and thanksgiving. He is good. He's absolutely good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together as a family. And I give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Oh, yeah. Well, the Lord has uh, specifically told me the things to say tonight, and, and I get a, a privilege of being able to be here tomorrow with the team. But um, the 11th hour team is here, so hallelujah. Oh, yeah, some of them's here. Stand up wherever some of you are. The 11th hour team is some of them's here. Oh, yeah, back here, back here, out here. <clears throat> now, uh, the Lord has, has said some things to me, and I, I was listening to Hank, and, man, I'm going to tell you, I am so glad to hear what I heard. The, the Lord said this to me. He said, the body of Christ has forgotten how to fight. He said, we have allowed the enemy to talk us into fighting with just our shoes of peace, our belt of truth, or our breastplate of, our, of righteousness, or we take off our helmet of salvation and with a carnal mind we beat the enemy over the head with religion. All because as a whole, we do not want to use the sword of the Spirit. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and, and, and this word tonight, the Lord said to give, and he's been dealing with me about this for all week. And I'm going to speak to prophets listening. You know, prophets are, are different. But the Lord said this to tell the prophets that your, your staff alone, your prophetic mantle alone will snap under the weight of the onslaught of death. It takes the written word and the prophetic together. I didn't get a lot of shouts, I, you know. But it takes the written word and the prophetic coming together in order to be the sword of the Spirit. Now, I, I want to show you some things, and I want you to look at Genesis chapter 7. Well, no, no, let's look at Luke 10 first. Let's look over at Luke 10. And I want to show you what I'm talking about. 
And I want you to get hold of this tonight because this is going to be really awesome. And behold, in verse 25, Luke 10, 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now here you have a doctor of the law coming, a lawyer, and he's coming to tempt him. And he says to him, he asks him, um, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asked him a question. He said, well, how do you read it? Because it all depends on what you can see in it. He said, how do you read that? He said, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, your neighbors, yourself. He said, yeah, that's right. Do this and you'll live. But the Holy Ghost told on the man and told the intent of his heart. The intent of his heart is why do I need you to make me righteous? Why do I need anyone to make me righteous? He said he willing to justify himself. He wanted to make himself right and he wanted to know why he couldn't. So Jesus starts telling this story. Now he's got two questions to answer. He's got to answer why he can't make himself right and who his neighbor is all in one discourse. So he says to him, he says, there was a certain man. Now it's not a parable anymore. When Jesus used the word certain, then it was a certain man. And he said, this certain man, why you can't make yourself right is because this certain man got up from his home in Jerusalem and traveled to Jericho. He went down this bloody way to Jericho. And on the way down there, he fell among thieves. And the Greek says he lied it among them. He joined them. He said, you can't make yourself right because this certain man left his home in Jerusalem, traveled down the bloody way to Jericho, and on the way down there, he fell among thieves. And he said they stripped him of his raiment. Notice they didn't take his money. They took his covering. And this is a certain man the master's talking about. Are y'all with me tonight? Are you just, uh, you want to talk about Zacchaeus or something? No? So he, he's, he's, he's headed down. He said he fell among the thieves. He joined them. They stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and left him half dead. Now notice they didn't go after his money. They wanted his covering, his clothing. So they wounded him and left him half dead. And he said, by, uh, there came a priest by that way and saw him and passed by on the other side. And the Greek says he went the opposite. There came a Levite by that way and he saw him and passed by on the other side or went the opposite. He said, but a certain Samaritan came by that way in his journey, went straight to the man, poured in oil and wine, bound up his wounds, put him on his own beast, carried him to the to the inn, gave the innkeeper two pence and said, you take care of him. And if he's any, if I'm any longer, this is enough to take care of him. And if I'm any longer in my return, I'll repay it when I get here. And I imagine the lawyer stood scratching his head because he read the same scripture Jesus did. But Jesus said, what did you get out of that? How did you read that lawyer? And he just read the scripture. Jesus said, let me tell you what I got out of it. He said, a certain man left his home in Jerusalem and traveled down to Jericho. What is he talking about? The certain man he's talking about is Adam. He said, you can't make yourself right because Adam's home was in Jerusalem. That's where his home was. And he said he left his home. He traveled down this road called the bloody way and he was headed to Jericho. Now, Jericho is really something because the Jews used to teach that, and they still do, that Satan's throne used to sit on the moon. And when the moon was full, he had his widest expression of power. And they called them in the New Testament lunatics. Well, what you may not know is 
Jericho in Hebrew means moon. And they're talking about this is where Lucifer's throne used to sit. On the moon. That's why he's cast out of the holy mountain in Ezekiel 28. He's talking about Jericho. That's why Joshua had to take Jericho first before he could do anything. So Jesus said, you can't make yourself right because a certain man, Adam, left his home in Jerusalem, traveled down the bloody way, headed toward the moon. On his way down there, he joined up with some thieves. The woman was deceived. The man was not deceived. Adam committed high treason. So he's joined up with these thieves, and watch what Jesus said. He said they wounded him, left him half dead. Now he knows good and evil. He's half dead. He said they took his raiment, the glory that covered him. And they left him wounded. And it said the priesthood couldn't save him. The Levitical law, the Levite, couldn't save him. But there was a certain Samaritan that in his journeys came right to the man. Now, a Samaritan is a person whose mama is Jewish, but their daddy is something else. Jesus' mama... <laughs> His mama was Jewish, but his daddy was God. And so he said, the priesthood couldn't save him. The Le Levitical law couldn't save him. But there came a man whose mama is Jewish and his daddy is God. And he came right to the man and he poured in the oil, the anointing and the wine, the blood. He picked him up, set him on his own beast. <laughs> Hallelujah! He put him on his own beast. Watch. Now, wait a minute. You might as well stay standing a minute. Carried him to the comforter. <laughs> Carried him to the innkeeper or the comforter, to the place of comfort. Set him on his own faith, his own beast, carried him to the comforter, full of the oil and full of the blood. Watch, gave the comforter two pence. Now, two pence is two days' wages. One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So he gave him enough to keep the anointed man at least 2,000 years. And he said, if I'm any longer in my return, you just put it on my MasterCard. I'll handle it when I get back. Oh, come on. Come on. Now, so now we are in, you see the prophecy of everything even to the 2,000 years. And in legal time, the 2,000 years will be about 2030 to 2033. Now, that's legal time. We're not subject to legal time. We, it's, our, it's our father's bat, our father's ball. We play till we win. That's, that's just the way that works. We'll just keep going till we win. Now... Let me, now I've told you that for a reason. You don't believe that yet, but I did. Now I want you to, I want you to, to go over to Genesis 7. Look at Genesis 7. We were in the New Testament. Let's go to the Old Testament. Genesis 7, are you still glad you're here? Yeah. All right, Genesis 7. There's some prophetic teaching. Amen. Okay, now I want you to watch this. See, a lot of people don't understand how the prophetic works. Isaiah 46.10 declares that God declares the end from the beginning and from the ancient times of things that haven't happened yet. So when the prophets, went, prophets, uh, prophets will go into the future, they'll see the big puzzle piece picture on the front of the box. 
And they'll go into the future and they'll come back into the present and have a memory of the future. Does that make sense? So they go into tomorrow and they come back to today and have a memory of the future. And then they start declaring the picture from the beginning. The end from the beginning. Everybody was expecting the end to show up at the beginning. And the prophets begin to declare, declare, declare what they were looking at. So what I want you to see here, and I, I can, I'm, I'm just going to do just a little of this tonight and then, and then um, we'll stop. But so when you know this in from the beginning and from the ancient times and things that haven't happened yet, then you understand something. Okay, here is the events of the ages as they play out. Now, we went all the way down to 2,000 years a, a moment ago. It was even two pence mentioned. And there was a gap of time, if I'm any longer. On God's time. Now watch this. So here's the way the events of the ages play out. Man, I don't believe that. I just don't believe. I don't believe it. Shh. You ready? So here it is. There will come the end of the age. At some point, the end of the age will occur. And when the end of the age comes, then there will be a catching away. What happens after that? There will be after that those with a mark killing those without them. At the end of that will come the end of the great tribulation period. What happens then? Jesus returns, puts his foot on the head of the enemy, so forth. What happens after that? A thousand year millennial reign. What happens after that? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sarabobobo Sandai. My God, do you feel the authority of the Lord in this house tonight? Praise God. Praise God. Remain standing. Tonight, I want to bring on a great gift to the body of Christ, precious. We highly esteem this man and the voice of the Lord that comes out of him. I thank God for his stability that he has released over the nations and to the church in this time. And so without further ado, make welcome Prophet Hank Kuhneman, mighty man of God for this hour. Hallelujah. Man, there's a presence in here. Wow. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Jesus. Yeshua. We honor you. Come on, just tell him. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you so much tonight, Yeshua. We thank you for the office that you have given of the prophetic office to speak, to hear the secrets of you, the almighty God. May it be revealed and may the spirit of truth rest strong upon this night that people will truly understand what it is that the mouth of the Lord speaks. And we honor you and we bless you and all the people said Amen. Wow, isn't he amazing? Wow, there's such a strong anointing here. It's going to be amazing. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Well, why don't you do this? Smile at somebody. Look at him. Say, I bet I know what you want for Christmas. <laughs> so I got to tell you a secret. So Pastor Kent, 
he wears these cool boots to my conference. And by the way, good evening. It's so much of an honor to be here. But uh, he wears these cool boots at my conference back in September in Omaha, Nebraska. And I said to him, I said, Pastor Kent, you know, I want a pair of those kind of boots. So he's been looking all over the place for them. And he said, you know, I don't know if they make them anymore. And he said, but I'm going to keep searching. I said, do you know that if you will honestly find those book, uh, boots, I will name those boots after you? He said, really? I said, yes, those will be called my Christmas boots. <laughs> I love, I love Pastor Kent. And uh, Pastor Candy, thank you so much for your friendship, your love, your, and the honor of being here. And uh, I like to surround myself with pure people. And you are that, and I thank God for you. And so it's just, I'm honored to be here because I'm carrying something so sacred. It's the word of the Lord to the people. So thank you for that. And also my other great friends, Pastor Robin, Pastor Robin, Prophet Robin, Pastor Robin, there you go. <laughs> and uh, talk about purity also. I love to surround myself with people of purity. And it's such an honor to be connected with the both of you and, and uh, your great family as well. And what a great church that you all pastor and you all pastor. And uh, I'm not traveling as much next year. I've been talking to God about it. He said, I'm restricting where you're going, Hank. You're going to be more calculated. And uh, if you all invite me, I have permission from heaven. So just so you know, I would love to stay connected there. Um, but I got to say this, so I'm here, you know, for two reasons. Number one, obviously, is to share with you the, the word of the Lord. In fact, I just flew in from Phoenix. Uh, I did a Flashpoint Live uh, service uh, last night in Phoenix. It was powerful. So, and uh, and uh, the way the night kind of went, it went kind of long for you that are here Central Time and those of you that are watching on the East Coast, I think if you stayed up, wow, it must have been like 1 o'clock or something like that by the time we wrapped it up. Pastor Dutch Sheets did a tremendous job kind of following up on the word that I delivered. But I only got to really get into a little bit of what I'm going to share tonight. And it's so amazing because uh, a few months ago, uh, quite a few months ago, uh, Pastor Kent said, hey, uh, we need to do some kind of conference uh, with Pastor uh, Prophet Robin. I keep calling you Pastor Prophet Robin and uh, you, yourself, Hank, and, and would you be interested? And I said, you know what? I feel like the Lord wants um, that to happen, and I feel like I'm supposed to be there. So then Flashpoint called and said, hey, we want you for two nights, and uh, it was the same, uh, it would have been the same Friday. And I said to Pastor Gene and, and to the ministry there, I said, no, I will come to Phoenix on Thursday. But the Spirit of the Lord said, you are to be there on Friday. So this is where we're at today. So I think it's very significant. So that's the number one reason that, that we're here is to be obedient. Second is, Pastor Kent promised me meatloaf. I mean, I, I love meatloaf. Everywhere I go, I always get meatloaf. My wife hates meatloaf, really kind of. And Brenda, if you're watching, not that you hate it. You just say it's not one of your favorite meals, but you always make it for me, and I thank you for that. So, But Brenda, I think they're letting me take some to the house because tomorrow I'm going to watch football all day and eat meatloaf and dessert. So there you go. <laughs> okay. But it is such a thrill to be here. I, I really feel like we are on a divine assignment. And... Uh, then we're going to have Prophet Robin come in uh, after, and I think the way the night's going to go, we're going to do kind of a release and activation. So let's get into what I believe that God is saying. And uh, again, thank you for your love, your hospitality, your friendship. And uh, man, I love you so much. I really do. Thank you again. Uh, I want you to open your Bibles, and those of you that are watching, um, I probably, I, I don't want to preach this, but it's really interesting. I just came off a of vacation and I was at one of those times in my life where we've just been so busy the last couple of years, and this year is busy. And I said to Brenda after our conference, I said, you know, I'm going to run a little bit harder, and then I'm going to take a break. And I needed to take a break. So I was thinking I was going to take a break. You know, I took a break from my phone, emails, people. How many of you have ever just need to take a break from people? And by the way, I've got two of my sheep here. Craig and Desiree, thank you for being here, and I love them. Can you wave your hands so they know how awesome you are? They're, they are special people, and I know they become great friends of the ministry here. But I just needed a break, and I thought God was going to give me a break. 
You ever thought that when you're on vacation? And so the Lord winds up giving me two spiritual dreams within one week of being on vacation. And Pastor Kent, uh, when he came to our conference back in September, I could see the spirit of the Lord on him when he walked up on the stage. And um, I went down, I told my wife, I said, uh, I don't think Pastor Kent's going to preach. I think he's going to prophesy. He prophesied the whole time. And if you have not yet seen it, please go out to uh, One Voice TV, and uh, you can literally see the conference the night that he ministered, as well as Prophet Robin Bullock, and it was so powerful what they shared and what they released. But I feel like God wants me tonight to give you a prophecy by way of instruction and revelation backed with the scriptures to give you a prophetic understanding and a narrative from scriptures what God is doing and how we are going to move. We've already into uh, 5783, the new year, and we have to stay ahead of what is coming in January where most people look at that as the new year. And God has declared that 2023 is going to be 2020 free. 5780 free. There's a freedom because of the harshness of the season that we've been on. Now, I want to clarify that because in 2018 and 2019, God began to speak through my lips. I know Prophet Robin Bullock, God was gave, giving him even more of a specific word. I was and so God was already warning the, the people that this was coming. And this was in 2018 and 19. I remember getting on the airplane. I was going to spend two days with Kenneth Copeland in prayer privately. And uh, he said, hey, bring the word of the Lord. Whatever, whatever you're hearing about uh, the, the new decade. Now, this was in 2019. And I remember praying all that week. I spent some time with God. I'm like, golly, I'm not hearing anything. So I was on the airplane, and, and I'm getting ready to land in Fort Worth, and I think I was like 30 minutes away. And I said, God, I haven't heard anything. I don't know how I'm going to show up to <laughs> Brother Copeland and say, well, I haven't heard anything, but, I, you know, you got to be honest with people. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to sleep. And I, I fell asleep, and the Lord gave me the word of the Lord, and he said, Hank, the decade that you're entering into, this is 2019, shall be known as the decade of difference. And it shall be like in the days of Israel and Egypt, and that shall be the prophetic narrative that shall play out among this nation and the nations. I said, okay. He said, but it'll start off harsh. And uh, how many know it started off harsh? And he said, but people will think that that is the way that it's always going to be. But tell them it is going to start off harsh, and then it will come into rest. In uh, 2019, it was two days before Valentine's Day, and uh, if you're a smart man like I am, married to a gorgeous lady of 33 years, she was at the office. I was getting the house ready. You know what I'm saying? I'm a smart guy. Two days before Valentine's Day, every day is love at my house, but here's the deal. I was trying to spoof up the house. Nobody can clean like a lady. I mean, man, you know how hard we try. It doesn't work. So I was cleaning, and I was wiping down the, uh, what do they call that, like where you put your pots and pans on it, stovetop? It was like a stovetop. So anyway, I think that's what, I couldn't remember the name, but stovetop. There you go. You know I don't cook. So I'm wiping down the stovetop, and there's like this, smudge or something on this glass top and I couldn't get it off and I was kind of getting frustrated. So I went to swipe it one more time and I shot up in a vision. And uh, I was taken at that time and I'm not naming dates or setting time, but I was carried 12 years into the future in the spirit and I began to see what was going on. And have you ever downloaded like a bunch of files and it's very rapid, one after another? I was seeing the years and events going so fast like it was being downloaded in my spirit, I couldn't keep up with it. But I said in the vision, I said, God, why is it so dark in 2020? Why is it so dark in 2021? And why is it dark in 2022? And as soon as I said that, it was around the time of the Jewish New Year, all of a sudden I saw there was a light that hit very harshly. 
that began to literally deal with the darkness and disperse it. And I could begin to see the darkness was not only dealt with harshly, but I began to see the brilliance of the light break through in 2022, right around the Jewish New Year, that literally was going to thrust us into the rest of the decade. And at the time, I didn't understand it, but look at 2 Kings chapter 6, if they will go with me. I want you, if they can, put up verse 25, and we'll look at verse 29 of that verse. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, you see that there was a famine in the land. Now, you have to understand, this is a very, very harsh time in the land at this time. There's a famine in the land. The people are hungry. Come on, how many have, have experienced certain harshness in, you know, going to the grocery store and empty shelves and, you know, nowadays, you, you know, you're not able to get baby formula. Come on, mamas. I mean, it's been crazy. People paying $6 for a gallon of milk. So there was harshness on the land. There's been harshness on this land. God said it ahead of time. There would be a harshness that the decade would start off, but then it would come up into rest. Now, this is important. How did God say it would end up? In rest. So then you hear preachers that have the spirit of doom and gloom on them, and they say, well, we're in the days of Noah, where they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, and then the end shall come, right? And they don't realize that, yeah, we are in the days of Noah, but what happened in the days of Noah? And they never preached this part. In the days of Noah, Genesis 7, 11, it says that God broke open the fountain of the deep state of things. And opened then the windows of heaven. And God dealt with the evil, the corruption, the darkness that had filled the earth to the point where God was hurting in his heart, you could say, grieved because he made man. But then the Bible says, but God found a righteous man, Noah. God found Noah, a righteous man. What these preachers won't tell you is that God in the days of Noah right now is dealing with corruption, the deep state, dark things, and he is about and in the process of raising up spiritual Noahs who have taken a stand of righteousness in this time. And here's where they're missing it. They have the spirit of the disciples upon them. Mark chapter 6, there's, it's starting to get dark. And Mark 6 says that the day was far spent. In other words, in their mind, it was too late to do anything. And the people had been there for three days, hungry. How are we going to deal with this big need? How are we going to deal with the masses? That's the question today. How are we going to deal with inflation? How are we going to deal with high gas prices? How are we going to deal with the harshness of the things that are going on? And what did God do? do the disciples here's the spirit of some of the preachers and people send them away the answer is escape the answer is we're in the days of Noah send the people away and rapture them let's just get them out that's the answer let's escape all of this that's going on I've heard more Christians man they they absolutely have a spirit of escapism just get us out of here I can't take anymore that's not the church that Jesus is coming back for and not only that, if you're going to use as an eschatology theology the days of Noah in regards to the rapture, actually Noah, the righteous man, and the ark, which represented the church, stayed. Now, I'm not talking about we're going through the tribulation. I just don't think you can take it as an eschatology theological comparison. You have to be careful. But what you can do is realize that God dealt with corruption, evil, and a dark, deep state of things. And he, and watch this, he raised up and honored and exonerated a righteous man and the ark or the church that stood in that righteous obedience of what God said. And what did the Lord ultimately do? Genesis 8, he brought a divine rebirthing and reset to the earth. Why is that important? 
March 15th, 2020. I'm praying at 2.30 in the morning, right after the scandemic was announced. And I went out at 2.30 in the morning, and they're talking about shutting down our churches. And I was praying, I said, God, what saith you? And at that time, God, I don't understand who it was, but I was taken up in the spirit over the earth. It's like somebody came and pulled my hair, and that's pretty hard to do, but they pull, it's like a sensation. It's like I was being pulled up by my hair. And I was taken up in the spirit and I was looking down over the earth and I zoomed in on America. And as I was zooming in on America, I, I watched it. In fact, I sent the word and told him this was what's going to happen. Because God was wanting something from him as the king, like in the days of Hezekiah, that he would pray prayers that would bring a humility to his heart that would ultimately cause God to move upon him, but also the kingdom or the nation that God had entrusted to him. And if you remember what President Trump said, he said, I never prayed more in my life. Because God needed to hear something. But the thing that happened is when I was caught up, I heard this very authoritative voice. And Prophet Kent, I don't know who it was. I, I, I assume it was Jesus. And I heard these words. Divine reset, divine reversal. And he said, this is the plan of heaven. March 15th, 2020, divine reset, divine reversal. Now you listen to everything that's going on in the earth and you think, and many people, and they, the elitists, think that it's about their reset. They even use the word reset. So you have to understand that God is countering everything that they're doing and they are trying to cons uh, deceive by getting people to think different than what God is declaring. So here in 2 Kings, it's harsh. There's a famine. But remember the Lord said in the word that I just told you, the decade would start off harsh. But then how would it end up? Do you know what Noah's name means? Rest. Because God's gonna deal with wickedness, corruption, he's going to judge it. He is judging it. He's going to deal with the dark, deep state of things, and he's going to reset and rebirth things in the earth. You watch. Now, there are three things that were happening in 2 Kings chapter 6 that I want you to see. The first thing in verse 25, if they'll put it up, is they were selling doves or donkey's head. Do they have this? I don't know if they're doing the scriptures or not. But they were selling donkey's head. Do you know how many people have bought into the liberal donkey lies that have affected their perspective and their mind? And it's added to the harsh season. The second thing that they were doing is they were buying dove's dung. You know what that represents to me? The state of a lot of the church. They've reduced the precious Holy Spirit to dung or waste. They've kicked him out. They exclude him. Or they all talk about past moves. And they don't understand that God is in the middle of an awakening and he's trying to raise up a glorious church. The third thing that happened, you can see this in verse 29, is to one point, uh, there was two women that they were so hungry that they agreed that they would boil each other's babies and eat them. And one woman was absolutely tricked, so to speak, by the other woman to boil their son and eat it, and they did. So you have the donkey head, which represents liberalism and all the woke and all the things that they're trying to get us to believe. Second, the church how it's reduced God, how it's been operating in this time. But the third thing is what they're doing to our children. You talk about harsh times. But guess what God's answer was? And I say this because I'm going to start moving in and telling you what's coming. And so God's answer was not the local media. You see, there are three sources of information. And this is why people... When they attack the prophets, they exclude the prophets, they put petitions up about the true prophets, they don't understand that you have just reduced yourself 
to an element of absolute dunceness. Is that a word, dunceness? Stupidity. Because there's three realms of information. The throne room is where God speaks to his servants, his friends, the prophets, where they get their information. The second realm is the second heaven, which is the witchcraft warfare realm, which a lot of information is formed and released from the demonic realm, and it's unfortunately it's released through the first realm or the media. And I hear a lot of things that people say today that is not from the throne room because I spend a lot of time there and I don't listen to the news, I don't watch it, and they will repeat what the enemy is saying in the second realm. They repeat then what they hear on the fake news and they take that as truth and that this is the way it's always going to be. And they form their perspective. That's why you have relatives that won't even talk to you today because they haven't been before the throne. And so they attack the prophets, and I want to say, okay, do you really believe that if God is going to communicate something in a season of harshness, that he's going to close the mouth of his prophets, and the voice of truth by the Spirit of God is now going to be subject to the second realm, the demonic realm, the prediction realm, the psychic realm, or the realm of whatever is being spoken in the culture is supposed to be truth, or the news. God does nothing in the earth unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So there's this harsh season. Donkey, dove's dung, boiling their next generation. A harsh season. What's God's answer? Second Kings chapter 7, a prophet arises, Elisha, who, by the way, prophet Robin carries that same anointing. And all of a sudden, the answer is, A prophet now is going to put things in proper perspective to let them know what is really going on. In fact, the king at that time literally begins to come after Elisha and want his head and says, this evil, this harshness is brought in by the Lord. That's what a lot of people are doing, blaming God. That's why they all come out with their eschatology scriptures, Gog, Magog, and Eggnog. And they try to put it all together. And they, and they exclude any kind of revelation or any prophecies of the prophets. But God raised up a prophet. And the prophet said, listen, you may be boiling your babies. You may be in the middle of a harsh season. But 2 Kings 7, listen to the word of the Lord. This time, tomorrow, it is all going to begin to change. And guess what? It did. And it is continuing that word. No matter the harshness that has been upon America, it is going to change. Now, can I tell you what that change is? And here's what they don't tell you. In Joel chapter 2, I heard him quote at many doom and gloom preachers. Don't you know, Joel 2 verse 2 says, it's a day of gloominess and darkness. See, we have a Bible verse. And a day of clouds and thick darkness. But they don't read carefully. Sure, there might be gloom and doom. Clouds and thick darkness, but the clouds and thick darkness is in the context of the same cloud, the same glory that appeared in 2 Chronicles 6, 1, the Shekinah glory of God, that Solomon said, what is this thick darkness? This is the Shekinah glory of God. So at the same time of doom and gloom, God comes in his glory. Arise, shine. The light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Darkness has covered the earth. Gross darkness the people. Genesis 1, light and darkness at the same time, but light overcomes darkness. Good overcomes evil. And as long as the Holy Spirit is in the earth, this is what they don't teach you. This is what every prophet needs to remember. God said to me one time in a visitation, he said, listen to me. He said, they quote Matthew 24, and they forget a verse, Hank. I said, what verse is that? He said, verse 14, they all talk about wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places, and yet Jesus said, hey man, the end is not yet. 
He said, I'll tell you when I'll wrap this baby up. Verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom, not just the gospel, there's coming a kingdom message. Watch this. But he said the gospel, the gospel is what? The good news. He said the good news, in other words, the good news of God, the good news of what, I, what I've done, the good news of what I will do, will be promoted in a time when there's wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places. There'll come a message and an interjection of my goodness. And it'll come as a witness. What's the witness? Not just talking about it. God's goodness and glory go together. So when you start talking about the goodness of God, the glory will show up. Exodus 33, 18. Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, first thing, I'll pass my goodness before you. So you have to understand, the goodness of God will be preached as a witness. The glory will come, and then the end will take place. And the Spirit of God said, as long as my spirit remains in the earth, I will always have a redemptive plan. You know what a redemptive plan is? A redemptive plan is always a plan of help, and a plan of hope. By the way, I'm keeping this. I like this, man of God. I like it. I'm keeping it. It's mine. It's got my sweat all over it. <laughs> there, you can't have it back. Now, I want you to go over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So what is God saying about this season? So on my vacation, I pressed God. I said, God, please, the people have to hear truth now. What are you doing as we head into 5780 free? 2020 free. You always know how to identify the word of the Lord if you understand how God used prophets. Many times the prophets, when they were released into the earth on assignment, they were always to release the opposite of what was happening among the culture or the people. Right? And so, here's what happens. God sends prophets to proclaim the opposite. What, are, what, what, is, what, are you, what are you hearing out there? Fear, doom, gloom, it's all over. Put your head between your legs and kiss your backside goodbye. It's, done, it's over. You hear the elitists talk about the NWO? the New World Order, and they're trying to preempt it. Yet the prophets are coming saying, whoa, there is an NWO. It's called a New World Outpouring. And God is trying to rebirth and reset the earth. So I asked the Lord, I said, give me, give me an analogy from Scripture then. Because I heard him say something to me. So he gave me Deuteronomy 6, verse, watch this, 23. Where are we heading in the Gregorian calendar? 23. Can they put that up or do they not? If they, they don't do it, I'll just read it. Should I just go with it? Okay, watch this. Are they showing scriptures or not? They are or they're not? They're not? Okay, I'll read it to you. And this is so powerful. It says, And God brought us out. God brought us us out, not 45, not the mayors, the governors, the secretary of state, not all the people we're putting our hope and our trust in. God brought them out. What was the word of the Lord before it all happened? Before the harsh season, before the scandemic, the pandemic? What was the word of the Lord? It would start off harsh. Now God is giving us a promise. I am bringing them out. Watch. The verse continues. I, God, am bringing them out to bring them in. So God's not bringing you out and just going to leave you helpless. God is bringing you out of your harsh season out of the struggles that we've had, of the treason, the fraud, the lies, the crimes, the evil, the dark, deep state of things, he's bringing us out of this. 
and he's bringing us in. He's bringing us in. He's bringing us in. Watch this. What's the promise? To give us the land, to give us America, which he swore unto our forefathers. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. We are coming out. We are bringing, God is bringing us out. We are coming out of this harshness, this lunacy, and he's bringing us in. And he's going to fulfill his promise, all the things that the prophets have said. They're going to happen. He's bringing us out to what? Bring us in. Now, I want to share this with you. So God was dealing with me about this. Think about what he did with Noah. He brought Noah out. Did he not? To bring him into what? A brand new divine reset as in the days of Noah. We all think it's doom and gloom and a rapture mentality. Yet God is looking at it, yeah, it is the days of Noah. I'm going to harshly deal with evil, corruption, the dark, deep state of things. I'm going to raise up those who are my remnant, who have stood in righteousness in a very evil, harsh time, and I'm going to divinely reset America. And let me say this, a reset will bring a receipt. A, re- a reset will bring forth a receding on many levels. And it's part of the new era that God promised. Now let's go here. So we've got these, these 2020 free, 5780 free coming. I want to bring your attention to Exodus 14. And I want to start in verse 19 as I'm going to start wrapping this up. And I would like for you to put it in the, I think it's the amplified version. That is the version I want you to see. Because God spoke this to me, and I never saw this as many times as I ever. <laughs> now, can I tell you why you need to pray for 45? Because if Jesus the Messiah was in the garden of Gethsemane, and prophets were stoned, and their blood was still crying out all the way from Abel till the time of Jesus, and he's in the garden, and he literally is feeling the weight of this, that he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not whose will? So at that moment, he had to submit his will. Through obedience, he endured the cross. He had to submit his will. Every prophet and prophecy that was ever declared through a mouth of a prophet or any prophecy about the Messiah was hanging in the balance. At the obedience of a man, would they obey? This is why you pray for 45 and others who God's hand is on, Netanyahu. Are you here? So that they can fulfill what God's heart, mind, will, and agenda is through the prophets. Are you listening? Now watch. So the Lord brought me to this narrative. Too many people are looking to the calendar event, and they don't understand what we heard from Kat Kerr, and, and I've said it, not knowing that Kat experienced this, is God is not held to our human calendar dates. That's why people got mad when January 21st came and went. What happened? The inauguration! Like God, you know, fell off his throne, didn't see it coming. But God's not subject or moved. That's why the scripture says when it came to Jesus... It was the fullness of time. God determined calendar event. This is when it's going to be determined. And so when God steps in on a calendared event recorded and determined in heaven, 
Watch how it begins to affect the earth. It's a mid-turn. God's going to take his turn. We've been waiting for righteousness to be established. We've been waiting for justice to come. We've been waiting, God, where are you? And God is saying, I have chosen this on my calendar, my event. This is about my terms. This is about my turning. You think it's about, well, will there be a red wave? What you need to say is, God, we want your terms. Take your turn now. Because when God steps in and says, it's about my terms now, I'm going to dictate, I'm going to step in, it's about my turning, guess what? Everything then has to shift and move according to what God says and what the prophets have proclaimed. Now watch, in Exodus 14, it says, are you ready? So if they can put that up here in verse 19, if not, I'll just read it. So it says, all right. The angel of God who had been going forth in front of the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud moved in front and stood behind them. And so it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud along with the darkness. But it gave light by night to the Israelites. Notice light and darkness at the same time. So one army did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over The sea. And the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind. Now, east always speaks in Scripture of judgment. It was an east wind. The priest, when he would take the sins of the people into the very door of the tabernacle, he would come in by the east door carrying their sins. And guess where he would head? West, towards mercy. That's why the Bible says, God casts your sins from the east, judgment, to the west. So there was a judgment that came. It was in motion. And God opened up the dry land and the waters were divided and the Israelites went out into the what? What does it say next word? Went out in the midst, the Amplified says, in the middle of the sea. What are we getting ready to come into? The mid or the middle term. We're coming in the middle, the mid, the midst. And God began to divide the right and the left. What is our midterms about? The right and the left and how the nation will pass through. And yet you skip over to verse 23 and watch what happens again. What year are we coming into Gregorian calendar It says, then the Egyptians pursued them into the middle of the sea. We talk about red wave. This was a red sea. And God waited for a red wave, which is what happened. A red wave came, right? You could say because it was a red sea, red wave, right? Not actual color, but you get it. Came while they were in the middle. The midterm. And guess what God said? They're right in the middle of a Red Sea, and I am now going to make it about my terms. I'm going to take my turn. And it became a mid middle turning. What happened? All the nonsense of a socialistic Egyptian empire that attacked a nation in the middle term or the my term, God's term, God's turning, verse 27 says, God absolutely turned it on them and they were no more. I want to say this last thing. Let me give you a quick rundown. What happens in the middle? In 2 Kings chapter 20, I'm just going to rattle these off before Prophet Robin comes, and then we're going to flow a different direction. I want to give him enough time. Am I, giving him too, am I taking too much time? I just want to end with this. 2 Kings chapter 20, notice what happens. The prophet Isaiah is in the middle court. So where is he at? In the middle. And the word of the Lord comes to him. 
and says, now go prophesy back to Hezekiah. Tell him that his prayers have been heard. I've seen his tears, and I'm going to heal him. And I'm going to turn back time. What is God saying to us? God speaking to the prophets at the time of the middle court or the middle term, God's term, and he's speaking and saying, tell the people, I have heard their prayers, and I am, in fact, healing this land, and I'm turning back time. As if it never happened in some regards. The second thing you can find is Judges 16. Samson stands in the middle place between a pillar on his left and a pillar of on his right, he's in the middle. Guess what happens? He puts his arm around the left, puts his arm around the right in the midterm, the mid place, and he pulled the house down. Not by his might, not by his power, but by the Spirit of God. In the middle, God pulled the house down. That was corrupt and evil. 2 Samuel 23, Shammah, in the middle of the field. 1 Chronicles eleven fourteen. 14, it says, They took their stand in the middle of the field and defeated the Philistines, and the Lord brought great victory to the nation. Where was it at? In the middle of the field when they took a stand. God answered and took out the enemy and liberated and freed a nation. Mark chapter 6, verse 47. The disciples are in a boat in the middle of the lake. And Jesus shows up. And the scripture says, intending to pass them by. They're in a test in the midterm when the winds were contrary, things were harsh. And Jesus is going to walk past them. And they were smart enough to get their eyes off of 45 and the politicians and get it on Jesus. And by the way, here's what they, they did like a lot of Christians. They saw a visitation of Jesus and thought it was evil. There are some Christians, some people, all they attribute in this middle season, this harsh season, all they keep attributing things to is evil. All they talk about is all the evil, and they don't realize there's a visitation of Jesus in the midterm of things. And guess what? It was Jesus' term that ultimately turned everything in Mark 6, 47, and gets in the boat. Come on, he's about to get in the boat of our midterm, and absolutely, watch what happens. The boat, supernaturally, the scripture says, it was transported immediately to the other side. Acceleration took place, and it was as though they hadn't even been there. Last one. Let me give you, but there's like 10 other ones, but let me, let me give you another one. Luke 5, how about this one? Luke 5, they couldn't figure out how to get a sick man into the house where Jesus was. So guess what they did? They took the roof off and they set him down in the middle. And they got a breakthrough. Are you ready? Are you ready? Why don't we stand to our feet for a minute? God brought them out to bring them in. I'm going to turn it back over. Pastor, can't come on over here because then we can come back up and do whatever. Father, I thank you that I delivered the best I know, the word that you gave me. I pray that you would seal it in their hearts, give revelation to the people, and let them know and understand that this is what you are saying at this time. Your terms, your turning and things will begin to shift because you're bringing us out to bring us in to the things that you have promised and prophesied to us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name.